In October of 1914, the King George V class dreadnought battleship HMS Audacious was carrying out gunnery practice off the coast of Ireland. Unbeknown to her captain, she was sailing straight into waters that had recently been visited by a German mine layer. Early in the morning, an explosion ripped through the hull and over 800 sailors were now in serious danger. Rescue, however, came in the form of the White Star Line's RMS Olympic. The sister ship of the Titanic was now in a race to save the crew and HMS Audacious herself. In the early 1910s, a new class of dreadnought battleships were ordered as part of the 1910-1911 naval programme. Designed as enhanced and enlarged versions of the Orion class of dreadnought battleships, they were the King George V class and consisted of HMS King George V, completed in November 1912, HMS Ajax, completed in March of 1913, next came HMS Centurion, completed in May 1913, and finally the class was complete when HMS Audacious was completed in August 1913. Her keel was laid down on the 23rd of March 1911 at the Camel Laird shipyard in Birkenhead and by September the 14th 1912 she was ready for launch into the River Mersey. She was completed and ready for service in August of 1913 although commissioning didn't occur until the 15th of October. HMS Audacious had a length of 597 feet 9 inches, a beam of 89 feet 1 inch and with a draft of 28 feet 8 inches. At normal load she had a displacement of 25,830 tonnes and this would increase to 27,560 tonnes when at deep load. 18 Yarrow boilers would send steam into two sets of Parsons direct drive steam turbines and each turbine had a power rating of 27,000 shaft horsepower, giving Audacious a top speed of 21 knots. And when cruising at 10 knots, she had a range of 5,910 nautical miles. Her armaments consisted of 10 breech-loading 13.5-inch Mark V guns. These guns were mounted in twin gun turrets with a pair of super firing turrets at the fore and at the aft with a single twin gun turret amidships. Along with his primary armament she was fitted with 16 breech loading 4 inch Mark 7 guns. 8 guns at the fore of the ship, 4 in the aft along with 4 casemate mounted guns along the side of the hull. And to complete her armament she was fitted with 3 21 inch submerged torpedo tubes. Upon her entrance service with the Royal Navy in October 1913 under the command of Captain Cecil Frederick Dampier, she joined her three sisters of the King George V class as well as the Orion class battleships in the second battle squadron of the home fleet. The following summer in mid July of 1914 with increasing tensions in Europe Audacious began preparing for war. She undertook mobilisation drills and as part of a full fleet review she along with the rest of the home fleet were considered vulnerable to attack by the Imperial German Navy and so on the 25th of July 1914 the home fleet were ordered to sail to Scapa Flow where it was thought the natural protection would safeguard the fleet. At the outbreak of the war the home fleet was reorganised and renamed the Grand Fleet and placed under the command of Admiral Sir John Jellicoe. Scapa Flow off the northern Scottish mainland had long been used as a natural harbour. Its sheltered waters had been used as far back as the Vikings anchoring their longships but in the advanced technological days of the early 20th century it was still regarded as a valuable strategic asset. It offered as much protection to the current iron dreadnought battleships as it did to the wooden Viking longboats all those centuries earlier. However German submarines were now starting to threaten that security. By October 1914 there had been numerous reports of submarine activity in the area of Scapa Flow which was making the Admiralty understandably concerned and as a result on October the 16th Admiral Jellicoe ordered that the Grand Fleet be dispersed to several bases around the country whilst the defences at Scapa Flow could be upgraded. HMS Audacious and the rest of the second battle squadron were ordered to sail to Loch Nakheel off the west coast of Scotland. On the 26th of October 1914 HMS Audacious departed her anchorage for routine gunnery practice. This was a routine sortie but would ultimately be her last. 
Three days prior to Audacia's setting off for her gunnery practice, the German mine laying ship SS Berlin was off the west coast of Ireland. The SS Berlin was originally a passenger liner, but had been requisitioned into the German Navy only a few days earlier to be used as a commerce raider and a fast mine layer. She was on her first mission under the command of Captain Hans Fundheller and was tasked with the disruption of British trade by laying a minefield at the entrance to the River Clyde. However, due to increased British naval activity in the area, Captain Fundheller was concerned for the safety of his ship, and so he altered the original plan. Rather than laying his mines at the entrance to the Clyde, he would instead lay them further out to sea, off the west coast of Ireland, to hinder the northern entrance into the Irish Sea. And on the 23rd of October, he succeeded in doing just that by deploying some 200 mines off Tory Island, which was off the northwest coast of County Donegal in Ireland. On October 26, 1914, the cargo ship SS Manchester Commerce was exiting the Irish Sea into the Atlantic Ocean, en route to Quebec, Canada. As she was sailing approximately 20 miles north of Tory Island, she struck a mine. The explosion that followed was devastating, and she sank in only 7 minutes, taking the lives of 14 of her crew. Due to the rapid sinking and the fact that the few survivors weren't picked up for several hours, no report of the minefield was made, and so the Admiralty was totally unaware of the danger that HMS Audacious and the rest of the 2nd Battle Squadron would be sailing into. By 5 o'clock in the morning of the 27th of October, HMS Audacious along with the 2nd Battle Squadron were 30 miles northwest of Tory Island, where they rendezvoused with light cruiser HMS Liverpool. The squadron formed up into line and headed towards Tory Island. By 8.45, they were 20 miles north of the island when the squadron was ordered into a turn to starboard to take them onto the range. They then followed an enormous explosion. HMS Audacious, who was third in the line, had struck a mine. The absence of a plume of water being thrown up suggested that the explosion had taken place well under the hull and just under the port engine room, which rapidly began to flood. On the bridge, the explosion was heard and felt, but the first impressions seemed to suggest that a gun had misfired, and Captain Dampier was not overly concerned. However, reports of the actual cause soon arrived on the bridge. As the Admiralty had not warned the fleet of any known minefields, Captain Dampier assumed that they had fell victim to a submarine attack. Standard procedure demanded that a general submarine warning be made to the fleet, and fearing for the losses to the 2nd Battle Squadron, all of the other battleships departed the area, leaving just Liverpool to assist the stricken dreadnought. Meanwhile, Admiral Jellicoe ordered assistance from any available destroyer or tug in the area. HMS Audacious had initially taken on a significant 15 degree list to port, but the rapid flooding of the engine rooms and adjacent compartments on the starboard side had slightly corrected this to about 9 degrees, although by 9.45 she was sitting very deep in the water. The Irish coast was 25 miles away, 40 kilometres, and Audacious was still able to produce power to enable 9 knots of speed, giving Dampier hope of beaching his battleship. So he turned south and made for Loch Swilly. While Audacious was making her reach for the shoreline and light cruiser Liverpool was circling her to deter the believed submarine threat, the radio distress communications had been intercepted by an approaching ocean liner. Bound for Glasgow having departed New York on the 21st of October, White Star Line's RMS Olympic, sister ship of the RMS Titanic which had been lost two and a half years earlier, had arrived on the scene. Even though the war was a few months old, transatlantic crossings were still being made, although passenger numbers had reduced significantly and were mainly made up of American tourists. The increasing submarine threat had deterred many people from making the crossing, and this crossing of RMS Olympic was to be her last, carrying only 153 passengers until after the war, although Olympic would subsequently be pressed into wartime service as a troop ship. By this point, Audacious had struggled along for about 15 miles, some 24 kilometres, but the continued flooding of the engine rooms had finally taken its toll, and she drifted to a stop. It was now 11am. Realising that his ship was now helpless, Captain Dampier ordered off all non-essential crew. Lifeboats from Olympic and Liverpool were launched to recover them to safety. 
by 1.30 p.m., with Audacious now crewed by only 250 men, Captain Herbert Haddock of the Olympics suggested that he take Audacious in tow, to which Dampier agreed. With the help of newly arrived destroyer HMS Fury, a tow line was connected between the helpless dreadnought and the Olympic. The ships began to move slowly. Unfortunately, the wind was gusting and the helpless, steerless Audacious was unavoidably attempting to turn into the wind, and this caused the tow line to snap. Further towing attempts were made using HMS Liverpool and Collier SS Thornhill that had just arrived on scene, but again, similar outcome was had. By late afternoon, messages were now circulating, albeit very belatedly, that SS Manchester Commerce had been sunk by a mine. Commander of the 1st Battle Squadron, Vice Admiral Sir Lewis Bailey, had now arrived and assumed command of the rescue operation, whilst at the same time, now that the submarine theory had been discounted, Admiral Jellicoe ordered out pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Exmouth to assist in the towing operation. By 5pm, no further progress had been made in towing Audacious to safety, and so, with daylight fading, the order was given to abandon ship. Bailey, Dampier and the remaining 250 crew were taken off in lifeboats and boarded Olympic in Liverpool. HMS Audacious was now alone and condemned to her fate. 8.45pm an HMS Exmouth had arrived, only to see the King George V class dreadnought heel sharply, pause and then capsize. There she stayed with the bow uppermost for about 15 minutes when an almighty explosion ripped through the upturned hull. The capsize had caused high explosive shells to fall out of their racks within B magazine and explode, which in turn ignited the cordite held within the magazine. Pieces of the ship flew through the air and 730 metres away, aboard HMS Liverpool, a petty officer was struck by a piece of armour plating and he was killed. He was the only sailor to lose his life during the sinking. The loss of such an important ship of the fleet was a disaster for the Admiralty. Admiral Jellicoe was very aware of the terrible effect it could have on the British morale, as well as the bonus it could give to the Imperial German Navy, if they knew that Britain had lost such a valuable asset. He therefore, with government agreement, ordered a suppression of the news. RMS Olympic sailed to Loch Swilly, where the liner and her passengers were held in custody. Many passengers had taken several photographs of the incident and British officials attempted to confiscate them, although as the passengers were mainly American, they were beyond British jurisdiction. During Olympics custody at Loch Swilly, only the crew of Audacious were allowed to leave the ship, but eventually, on the 2nd of November, Olympic and her American passengers were allowed to sail for Belfast, where they disembarked. The secret didn't last long, however, as on the 19th of November, it was common knowledge in Germany that HMS Audacious was lost. The loss wasn't officially announced in Britain until the 14th of November 1918, with the following announcement. HMS Audacious, a delayed announcement. The Secretary of the Admiralty makes the following announcement. HMS Audacious sank after striking a mine off the North Irish coast on October 27, 1914. This was kept secret at the urgent request of the Commander-in-Chief Grand Fleet, and the press loyally refrained from giving it any publicity. Thanks very much for watching. Please take a moment to hit the like button and consider subscribing.